Bluebird CN7 was Donald Campbell's turbine-powered land speed record challenger. Though years ahead of its time when it was designed, it was destined to mark the end of an era in record breaking. By the late 1950s, Donald Campbell had become one of Britain's most celebrated figures, having repeatedly broken the world water speed record in his jet-powered hydroplane, Bluebird K7. Inevitably, his thoughts turned to breaking the land speed record. In 1947, John Cobb had set the existing record at 394.19 miles per hour in the Railton Mobile Special, a highly streamlined design powered by two 1450 horsepower Napier Lion engines. The FIA's rules covering the design of land speed record cars at the time declared, it shall be a land vehicle propelled by its own means, running on at least four wheels, not aligned, which must always be in contact with the ground. The steering must be assured by at least two of the wheels and the propulsion by at least two of the wheels. Donald and his trusted collaborators Ken and Lou Norris, designers of Bluebird K7, could see that using one or more large piston-driven engines was unlikely to give the sort of power-to-weight ratio necessary to beat Cobb's record by any significant margin. A gas turbine would provide suitable power, but thrust-driven cars were illegal. The Norris Brothers' radical design used a Bristol Siddeley Proteus turbojet engine, developing over 4,000 horsepower, modified to feature drive shafts at both ends of the engine to drive all four wheels. The FIA made it very clear that the engine must not provide any thrust, and so the hot exhaust gases were ducted out of the body to help smooth out the disturbed air at the rear of the car. Designed to run on specially made high-pressure Dunlop tyres, CN7 had independent suspension and is credited by F1 designer Adrian Newey as the first car to properly recognise and use ground effects. The aerodynamic body was developed in Imperial College's wind tunnel, where work on the K7 hydroplane had also taken place. Other cutting-edge features included air brakes, built-in jacks, telemetry and a heads-up cockpit display which Campbell eventually rejected because the digits were green, which he deemed unlucky. With a design speed of 475 to 500 miles per hour, Bluebird measured 30 feet long by 5 feet 6 inches wide, that's 9 metres by 1.7 metres, and weighed 4.2 tonnes, or 4,300 kilograms. In 1960, it had cost over £1 million to build. That's £23 million in 2019. CN7 was built by motor panels in Coventry starting in late 1959. A sleek body covered an extremely strong aluminium honeycomb egg box monocoque that owed much more to the construction of aircraft than automobiles. At the time, not even racing cars were using this type of construction. The all-aluminium bodywork featured complex shapes panel-beaten to extremely tight tolerances to aid the car's aerodynamics. Campbell and his team travelled to Goodwood Motor Circuit in July 1960 for technical trials. Designed for high-speed, straight-line running, Bluebird was never going to run at speed at Goodwood, but the team were able to tow the car to test handling, before Bluebird lapped the circuit idling under its own power. A top speed of 100 miles per hour was reached on the straight, but with limited steering and brakes designed for slowing from much higher speeds, faster running was impossible. When Bluebird was unveiled to the press and public at Goodwood, it made headlines all over the world. Sleek and futuristic, it was touted as the most advanced car in the world and a great example of British ingenuity and engineering prowess. When it lined up for photographs on Goodwood's start line with three previous land speed record holders, Malcolm Campbell's original Bluebird, the 1000 horsepower Sunbeam and the Golden Arrow, the message was clear. If the three museum pieces were part of a glorious past, then Bluebird represented future success. Incidentally, Bluebird CN7 would eventually become the fourth permanent member of the same museum display at Bewley. 
The Bluebird team arrived at Bonneville at the start of September 1960 and began testing CN7 a few days later. Early runs showed that the car accelerated strongly but there were some technical issues. There were oil leaks, the steering was oversensitive and the suspension geometry needed modification. It was 10 days until the car ran again, this time at a peak speed of 240 miles per hour. Campbell reported that although Bluebird had a tendency to wander laterally across the course when at speed, the air brakes and mechanical braking systems were working well. The course across the Bonneville Salt was marked with black oil lines, one at the centre of the course and one at each edge, 40 feet or 12 metres from the centre, to give two prepared lanes. The condition of the salt was giving some cause for concern, with the surface breaking up and potholes forming. Early on September the 16th, Campbell drove a fifth successful run in Bluebird at 300 miles per hour and declared that he wanted to test the car's acceleration and braking capabilities on the next run. Less than an hour later, Bluebird was underway again, this time accelerating hard off the line. Members of the team gave chase as usual, although by the time they got up to speed, Bluebird was little more than a speck on the horizon. Suddenly, they saw a blue object flying upwards out of an expanding dust cloud. Out on the salt, Campbell and Bluebird were in trouble. As they neared the scene, it was clear there had been a big accident. Wreckage and smears of blue paint on the salt formed a trail that ended at the battered hulk of Bluebird, sitting upright on the salt with its wheels torn off. Team members managed to get the cockpit canopy open, to find Campbell dazed but moving, his overalls spattered with blood. On a stretcher, on his way to the ambulance, Campbell was heard to mumble, I seem to have clouted my ear. In hospital, with a fractured skull, a burst eardrum and numerous cuts and bruises, that evening he still managed to give his account of what had happened. I suppose I had survived the fastest crash that mankind has ever survived. I run the road back now and she's swerved by collected back and took a flower chair over to the side of the course. We caught a lot of blast the road and the side one tragic one will outside rule of rules caught the soft south. And the book launch will uh have a heat uh cause the car to spun on the spun terrible racket. Out of control at 350 miles per hour, Bluebird had flown for 275 metres, somersaulted, bounced three times and slid a further 360 metres before coming to a halt. Whatever the cause, the world's most advanced car was a wreck. Back in the UK, Sir Alfred Owen, owner of the Rubery Owen Group, whose subsidiary motor panels had built CN7, made a generous offer. If Donald was prepared to drive Bluebird again, he would rebuild the car. Bluebird was extensively damaged and although part of the structure looked reusable, it was decided it would be safer to rebuild it completely anew. Most of the mechanical parts had survived, but the engine and gearboxes were sent back to their manufacturers to be stripped and rebuilt. The engine was returned to the team with an additional 150 horsepower available. The most obvious modifications to Bluebird during the rebuild were the addition of a large tail fin to help improve directional stability and a revised cockpit canopy. However, plenty of other changes were made, among them an electronic throttle controlled from buttons on the steering wheel to limit how fast power could be applied, a braking parachute and padding in the cockpit to better protect the driver if a similar crash happened again. The rebuild took around 18 months to complete. After testing at RAF Tangmere, Campbell once again showed Bluebird off to the crowds at Goodwood in July 1962. In 1963, Campbell's team headed to Lake Eyre in Australia. The dry lake bed, baked hard by the sun and rarely troubled by rain, promised to be a perfect surface on which to run the revised Bluebird, with room for the required 12 to 15 mile course and the promise of less weather issues than Bonneville. However, the day after the course was ready, it started to rain, and over the next week more than a year's rain fell. The team moved their operations to a different area of the lake bed and eventually managed to run at 260 miles per hour on 25% power but the weather followed them and two huge storms in late May led to Campbell moving Bluebird off the lake in the middle of the night to avoid rising floodwaters. 
the 1963 campaign was over. In 1964, Campbell and the team tried again. In the months since they had returned home, Campbell had been widely criticised for mismanaging the project and failing to read the conditions. This was somewhat unfair as the Lake Eyre region was experiencing the worst weather conditions it had ever seen. Nevertheless, sponsor BP withdrew from the project and there were other issues with disagreements and infighting in the Bluebird camp as they returned to Australia. Despite all of this, and with continuing poor weather chasing the team, on July the 17th, 1964, Donald Campbell and Bluebird finally set a new record of 403.1 miles per hour, with a peak speed of 440 miles per hour. Analysis of data from the car after the record suggests that on the first of the two record runs, Campbell had forgotten to press the power limit override switch on the steering wheel. The net result was that 30 seconds into the run, at a speed of 325 miles per hour, Bluebird stopped accelerating, before Campbell noticed his error 25 seconds later and accelerated up to Bluebird's 440 miles per hour peak during the measured mile. Without this error, it is likely that the record set by Bluebird would have been closer to 500 miles per hour. However, with the deteriorating lake bed shredding the tyres and the new record in his pocket, Campbell's land speed challenge was over. Having broken the land speed record, albeit only by 6 miles per hour, Campbell went on to take the world water speed record on the very last day of 1964, becoming the only man in history to have broken both records in the same year. In late 1963, American Craig Breedlove had set a two-way record of 407.45 miles per hour in the thrust-powered Spirit of America. Although not recognised by the FIA as it did not conform to their land speed record rules, the motorcycle-focused FIM recognised the record under their own rules. Although Campbell's subsequent record in Bluebird was recognised as a new land speed record, it was clear that record breaking was about to undergo a seismic shift. Sure enough, in October 1964, the FIA and FIM agreed to recognise an outright record, with restrictions on the use of thrust-driven vehicles lifted. Consequently, just three months after it had set the record, Bluebird CN7 was rendered obsolete. CN7's final runs were made in June 1966 at RAF Debden. Before Campbell was due to give a demonstration run at a gala, test driver Peter Bolton lost control of the car. At 100 miles per hour, it ran through a fence, crossed a road and came to rest in a field. Campbell's subsequent demonstration in a damaged CN7 took place at low speed, and after that Bluebird never ran again. It was eventually restored in 1969, and since then it has remained on display at the National Motor Museum, Bewley, in the south of England. There was nearly an ironic postscript to the Bluebird CN7 story. In 1971, Craig Breedlove, whose Spirit of America had ushered in the era of thrust-powered record breakers that rendered CN7 obsolete, approached Donald's widow, Tonya, to obtain permission to use the car for a new attempt on the wheel-driven record. A publicity model was built, but the Bluebird America project received little interest from sponsors and was quietly dropped. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe and check out my channel for more tales of Donald Campbell and other record breakers. Until next time.